If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Mark chapter 2. We've been in a series called From the Cradle to the Cross as we've been through the Christmas season and we're going to be taking a look at Mark and we'll be moving through Mark at a rapid pace. So I know as I prefaced last week, we'll be moving at a pretty good speed, but there's some intentionality behind it. And so just bear with us. Um, the series through Mark records Jesus' ministry from John the Baptist to the cross. And Mark, remember, focuses upon the suffering Son of God. That's his focus. You, if you compare the Gospels, you're going to see some chronological differences, and they're not going to be in order, and that's perfectly fine. That's not Mark's focus. Mark's focus is to line up themes that are pointing people to the suffering Son of God. Last week, if you remember, we talked about uh, the battle with the enemy is never over. As believers, when you and I come to the faith, the battle of the enemy actually heightens. Your awareness becomes more prevalent, and the enemy begins to attack you, he and his minions. Our response with God is not later, it's now. We talked about the immediacy of responding to Jesus' invitation now and not later. And then we talked about compassion towards the broken starts now as well. Jesus, in Mark's narrative, uses, uh, Mark travels us through the narrative using immediately, immediately, immediately. He's rushing us through uh, Jesus' life in ministry, and there's a sense of urgency. And for you and I to walk away with anything today is we need to be responding to the will of God, to the leading of the Holy Spirit now. Let's not delay. Let's not push it off. Let's not harden our hearts. Let's not deafen our ears. If God is moving in our lives, if God is moving in our midst truly, and he's laid something on your heart that is biblical, that's going to bring him glory, that's going to diminish you in the sense you're not going to take the glory, we need to be able to respond immediately to say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Send me. So if you found your way to Mark chapter 2, read with me. And if all goes well with technology, we should have everything overhead that I'll be able to walk us through. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they laid down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, says to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, says to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed. And they were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. And he went out again by the seashore, and all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. And he passed by. He saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And it happens that he was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them, and they were following him. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and they came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. 
No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear results. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost in the skins as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. And it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This particular chapter houses three main points that I see, and the last point actually bleeds over into next week regarding the Sabbath. But when the kingdom of Christ advances, homes become places where lives change. This is what I want us to focus on. Your home becomes places where lives change. If you look with me in Mark verses 1 and 2, Jesus has already finished teaching. Now he's at home. This is probably not his home because we know Jesus said the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He doesn't own anything. If we link this back with chapter 1 verse 29, we see he's in Peter's house. Peter's house became the hub of ministry where Jesus was at. This is a small group that was learning the word of God by Jesus. Jesus returns. He's in Capernaum. He was at home, and notice what Mark records. He was speaking the word to them. He was speaking the word to them. He was teaching them. This is a small Bible study group. Remember, in the first century, the church didn't meet in buildings like this. This is actually foreign to Scripture. There was synagogues. Synagogues were smaller, houses of learning, developed probably in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, to learn the word of God so that you would not rebelliously sin against God. So, but houses, small churches began in homes. And this is where we see this is taking place. You see, because in your home, this is where life takes place. This is where kids run around. This is where babies cry. This is where food is shared. This is where life happens and people will come to your home as they did with Jesus, and sometimes these irreligious people may not go to the synagogue, or in our modern day, they won't come to church. But they'll go to your house. And what is Jesus doing here? He is expositing the word of God to them, speaking the word to them. He's teaching them. You see, your home is also where heartache is at, is it not? You have celebrations, We have joys, we have memories, you have a little marker where your kids are growing, probably somewhere on your door jam, somewhere, but you also have it where sometimes death takes place, sometimes something happens where a loved one passes. But this is the reason why the home is the perfect setting and people come to homes and they're flocking to Jesus. They're coming. It's so crowded and possibly this 18-foot home, the homes in first century Capernaum are not like modern day houses. They're not this big. They usually would stack upon each other. Usually, if you're an agricultural farmer, the livestock is at the bottom level because that's what radiates the heat that comes up. So it's very compact. It's very efficient. And there's no room for anybody to be there because it's all crowded on the inside. Jesus is teaching the word of God. Mark records that it overflows to the outside and all of a sudden there's a group of friends that have a man that's been paralyzed and they want him to see Jesus. Jesus is teaching. So why are people coming to him? Two points. People desire to be in the presence of God. People desire to be in the presence of God. Are our homes places where people can encounter Jesus? Do we adjust our life where people can come, believer or non? We befriend them. We could be cordial. You don't have to agree with them. But we invite them in where they can encounter Jesus. Because people, you and I are created in the image of God. The atheist, the Buddhist, the Muslim, whoever it is, if you have breath in your lungs, you are created in the image of God. Therefore, innately and intuitively, we desire to worship something. 
It's a fingerprint image, if you will, that God has stamped on us. And when people hear the word of God, if the Holy Spirit is moving in their lives, people will have a drawing to be in the presence of God. People want this encounter and they're attracted to Jesus. But secondly, people also desire to be around compassionate people. Nobody likes to be around arrogant people. Nobody likes to be around people that love to win the argument at the expense of their relationship. If you've ever been in an encounter where you're talking with somebody and they have such a strong personality, no matter what you say, you're wrong. But go ahead and talk. Just, just know that you're wrong as you're actually talking to me. And then they'll correct you mid-sentence. And then they'll, if you're trying to work out something, if you're trying to articulate something because God has laid something on your heart, you don't really know what's going on. So you're a vocal processor. So you speak and you're trying to work it out and they are just critiquing you and criticizing you. All, nobody, nobody likes to be around people like that. People like to be around people that have the presence of God within them and that are compassionate. In case you haven't noticed in the first two chapters of Mark, compassion is Jesus' main focus. He's a suffering son of God who steps into our brokenness to bring compassion, to bring healing physically and spiritually, but he moves with compassion so that you and I can encounter this. Should this not be our church today? Should this not be you and me? We have differences with people. Sometimes our personalities don't jive well with people. And you know what? That's fine. Because chemistry, I don't understand the whole makeup of it. But sometimes you and I just clash with certain people. But if we are humble in the presence of God to work through it, to identify the differences, to know where your healthy boundaries are at, that's okay. On Thursday night at the Bible study, I said this and I'll say it again. When you have family, you have problems. When you have a church family, guess what you have? You got problems. That's family lifestyle. That's okay. We come together in all of our imperfections, so stop trying to be perfect. Stop trying to pretend like you have everything together because Lord knows you don't. But we come together, maybe not in a house, but we come together to hear the word of God, to study the word of God, so we can learn the word of God, so that other people can experience the word of God, and they too are attracted. And like the book of Acts records of, of a person that's lost can come into the presence of the church, and they can say, surely God is in the midst of this church. Because we're humble, we're honest, we're compassionate. When people are broken, we don't point out their brokenness and then teach them a lesson about their brokenness because guess what? They're already aware of their brokenness. But do we come alongside them to help them in their brokenness? Maybe just walk with them. What I appreciate about first century Judaism and even modern day Judaism is that when people pass away, they have a ministry of just presence. And you may have heard me say this before. Sometimes when you and I, when somebody passes away, Lord takes them, however it is, we always feel the need to give a Hallmark card moment of a scripture verse. I got to say something. And so we want, and our intentions are right. But sometimes what you tell them doesn't really help them through their brokenness. And sometimes Christians need to learn the art of just silence. In Judaism, usually when somebody passes away, you have people that come to the house, they help you clean, they help you grocery shop, they help you do everything so that you and your family can grieve for a 30-day process at least. During this time, they will not initiate a conversation with you unless you initiate it with them. They are just present. And they're helping you take care of the menial things that kind of fall by the wayside because you're emotionally preoccupied but they have a presence there. And then if I, if it was in my family, if I started a conversation, then they would engage. But they don't ram you. They don't cloud you. They don't shove all this stuff because they know that you're grieving and grieving is normal and grieving should be done. And unfortunately in our American culture, we do not grieve. We'll give, uh, businesses will give you about maybe a three to seven day window to grieve, process everything. And you better get back to work. Biblically, it's a 30-day process. 
We need time to grieve and emotion. It's the time to be compassionate. People that are broken, people that have a paralytic friend, and they're seeing Jesus, and they want to bring him to him because Jesus is compassionate. Continue with me. Notice what Mark records. When Jesus heals the paralytic, notice the theologians of, of the day. They were reasoning in their hearts, who can forgive sins but God alone? Instead of glorifying God, that a miracle is happening, because Jesus is orthodox, let me take that back. In some areas, Jesus' doctrine is hyper-orthodox. So they know he's of God. They know they just battle with him because Jesus is challenging their traditional interpretations upon Scripture. Jesus never challenges Scripture. He is the embodiment of Scripture. He challenges the interpretation upon Scripture. They're reasoning in their hearts, and they're saying, why is this guy doing what he's doing? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus is not only exercising his authority as the suffering son of God and his deity, he is also letting them know he can read the hearts of men. Why are you so caught up in your doctrine that you can't even see what is taking place in front of you? You're so concerned. See, it's at this point that the religious leaders are at a crossroads. They can either pay attention to what Jesus is doing. They can either pay attention to what is happening in their midst and notice the response of the people. They are all glorifying God. To be able to dig through a first century home is not hard. It's thatch and a little bit of clay. It's not going to take construction work like our houses. But notice the uh, perseverance of the friends. They want this paralytic man in the presence of Jesus. They interrupt his teaching. Debris falling from the top, and they lower him down. And Jesus doesn't rebuke them, saying, well, well, why did you just interrupt my three-point sermon? I can't believe that you did this. Everything's going on. People are looking. They're going, what's going on? And then immediately when they lay, he sees the faith of the friends. He sees the faith of the paralytic man. He stops everything. And this is a teaching moment where this man, the friends, and people encounter. And the reaction of the theologians of the day are, Psh, look at this guy. I mean, look at, his, look at just what he said. Jesus is exercising his deity as well as his compassion. And the religious leaders can either choose to say, you know what, praise God. Or they can immediately retreat and go about the way that they did. Their traditional interpretation is more precious than what's taking place in their lives. Do you and I at times hold on to things that God just needs to clear away? We see God moving in somebody's life that, let's be honest, you, you basically judge them. You see God moving in their life and you think the Lord will never do that. And all of a sudden they are. And maybe all of a sudden they're growing phenomenally. And maybe all of a sudden they're growing to the point to where it almost checks your pride because they have a hunger and a desire for Jesus that you no longer have. And we get jealous. And we immediately go, well, if they would just remember, remember that person when they were back in, when they were drug dealers, they were meth addicts, they were a prostitute, they were all the way through that. And Jesus reads the hearts of men. Jesus reads the hearts of men. People want an encounter. Our homes need to be places where people can encounter Jesus. So here's, here's my question for us to reflect on. Are our homes places where people, lost or saved, can experience God in compassion? When you move through life, your friends, your family, your job, your employer, your, if you're retired, your connections, wherever it is, when you move through life, do you move with compassion and forgiveness? Or do you, re, or do you move through life like a, uh, like a religious leader? Quick to correct people. You don't even bother to get to know them. You rather win the argument at the expense of the friendship. Jesus moves with compassion. The presence of God is powerful if we can relay the word of God with compassion and hope, let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit will, will, will bring the conviction. 
And maybe if you and I take time to learn about people, to learn about the area where they've come from, if you and I take time, maybe that person or family will give you the trust to speak truth into their life versus you just hammering it over the head because they're already aware of their brokenness. What they want to experience is compassion and forgiveness. Jesus has this. The disciples have this. Peter's home overflows with this. Do our homes overflow? Do our lives overflow with this? See, when the kingdom of Christ advances, Jesus calls those who are willing to follow him. Jesus calls those who are willing to follow him. In first century Judaism, the disciples, quote-unquote, those that were the best of the best, would seek out a rabbi. A rabbi may take one, two, maybe three tops. But the student comes to the rabbi, goes through an interview process, and the rabbi would say yes or no. Jesus doesn't wait. Jesus initiates. And by the way, he took 12 students. More than likely, historically speaking, probably in their mid to late teens. Because only Peter pays the temple tax in Jesus. That's 21 years and older. The other disciples don't. So they're probably in their mid to late teens. And Jesus calls. Notice what he does with Levi. He says, follow me. And notice Levi, who traditionally recorded as Matthew, he got up and followed him. He's already called Simon Peter and his brother. He's already called people, fisher people uh, uh, fishermen. It's an honest trade. It's a lucrative trade. But notice who he's calling now. He's calling a tax collector. In the first century, especially if you were a Jewish and you were a tax collector, that was a very, very bad business to be in because you worked for Rome. The Jews were already heavily taxed. The Jews were already some double, triple. They were taxed uh, enormously. And so if you were Jewish and you were working for Rome or Herod, and you're enforcing the tax, well, how do you make your income? You charge extra. It's a commission. So they were looked at as traitors to Israel. People that you would not, they could be considered irreligious. Your Bible translates that as sinners. Some of your uh, Bible translations will give you a footnote. Not that they disregarded the law of God, they were considered irreligious. They were not good enough. They were the scum of the earth. Levi, tradition holds that he actually is Matthew, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Levi hears the call of Jesus, and he got up and followed him. See, if you were a fisherman, you could go back to your trade, like Peter does when he denies Christ. When you leave your station as a tax collector, you leave everything. There's no going back to that. And Jesus calls him. You see, Jesus sees past all of the cultural barriers that ancient and modern day culture erect. And he reaches into the heart of people and he places value upon them. Come, follow me. And it immediately resonates in Levi. Notice the chain of events. Jesus sees value and purpose in Levi who is later called Matthew. He breaks cultural customs and calls to him to be his disciple. Levi doesn't search him out. Levi responds to the call then, immediately, not later. And this leads to a dinner with other disreputable, irreligious Jews, according to the scribes and Pharisee. So this calling of Levi opened the door for Jesus to meet Levi's friends. And what's going on? Jesus is eating with them. He's not eating with the John MacArthur's of the day, the John Piper's. He's eating with irreligious people. And it's the theologians of the day that get extremely upset. Why isn't he eating with me? Do you not know who you're eating with? Do you not know the reputation of these people? And then Jesus launches into a teaching moment about God calls those who know they are in need of a Savior. Those who know that they're broken, not those who pretend to be religious as if you need no Savior. 
And if you notice throughout Jesus' ministry, it's the broken who respond to him. It's not the theologically uh, educated. They do respond, but not nearly in the masses as the common people that are just trying to live day by day. They respond to him in droves. It's the religious leaders who battle Jesus. You see, Mark immediately transitions this encounter about fasting and discipleship. But notice how Luke records something here. Luke in chapter 18, Jesus launches into a parable. He tells people who trusted in themselves, pay attention to that. They trust in themselves that they were righteous and they viewed others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Ironically, that's who we're dealing with in Mark chapter 2. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was un even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Here is a deeper look into the heart of people when religion and pride take over your humility. Jesus gives them a perfect example. Here you have a theologically educated man, a Pharisee, and here you have a tax collector, disreputable, shameful. They both go to the temple. In Mark chapter 2, they're talking about fasting. They're talking about following God. And Jesus in Luke says, here, look at the, look at the credentials of this religious person. He tithes above and beyond. He fasts twice a week. By the way, the Bible only commands one fast on the Day of Atonement. He fasts Tuesdays and Thursdays. He does all these things extra above and beyond, and I'm glad I'm not like this guy over here. By the way, the adulterer, and everybody, look at me. My identity in God is found in my performance. I perform a lot for you, God. I'm pretty clean. And the tax collector is just beating his heart. He's humbled in the presence of God. He knows his position, and he says, forgive me, the sinner. Notice he doesn't unfold, Lord, forgive me, because of other. He just says, Lord, forgive me. I'm struggling. And Jesus says, guess who went home justified? Wasn't the religious person. Pride and arrogance. Jesus then launches into the new wine and the old wineskin examples to reiterate God's call that he will call whom you may not agree with. And you know what? That's okay. My professor, and I may have said this from the pulpit, if well, I'll say it again. And one of my classes at seminary was evangelism and missions. We had to go door to door. You had to have X amount of conversations, structured in a way that really, anyways. So he was lecturing and talking. And so we have street evangelists, right? We have people on the corner with the bullhorn, people in Vegas, street evangelists. We have door to door evangelists. We have a whole bunch of varieties of evangelists, and people critique everybody. Look at that, look at that. So as him and I were talking, or well, he was talking to the class, He's been on the streets in Mardi Gras evangelizing. He's been on the bullhorn with other people. He's been in almost every single situation of evangelism. And then one thing he said really, really humbled me. He said, just be careful, as he was telling to the class, he's like, be careful to critique when you critique somebody's method of evangelism with your non-method of evangelism. Because we can easily say, well, they don't go door to door. They don't do it this way. And look at that person on the street in the bullhorn. I wouldn't do that. That's probably driving people away. Yeah, probably. What are you doing? If you're not doing anything to reach people for Christ, you have no room to talk. Don't critique somebody's method of evangelism with your non-method of evangelism. And once I heard that, it really took me back because I realized how easy it is to become critical. We become critical of people. We become like the Pharisee. Well, I got this. I know this. I have all this Bible knowledge. How about just reaching to broken people? Well, Lord, that makes me uncomfortable. Well, good. 
How about inviting them over to your house so that your house could be a place where they can encounter compassion? You don't have to agree with them. You don't have to agree with their lifestyle. You don't, but can you build a bridge to speak truth into their life where all of a sudden you might be the catalyst that causes change in their life? The Holy Spirit will use you. You see, we have to get off our high horses and we have to get down with people where they're at. See, the new wine and the old wineskin, those that are the old vanguard. Notice the Pharisees and the scribes. They're guarding their tradition of interpretation upon Scripture. And Jesus is rattling that. He's not challenging Scripture. He's challenging their traditional interpretation. Tradition has a place. You and I would not be here if it wasn't for tradition. Tradition has a place. But when tradition becomes more important than God moving in your midst, you have a problem. Notice how Douglas Mangum captures this. He says, To put new wine in fermentation into an old wineskin would result in the ruin of the old wineskin and the loss of the wine. For those of you that do not get that, when you have a brand new wineskin of an animal, you put unfermented grape juice with sugar, and it ferments and it expands, and the elasticity of the skin is no longer there because that wine has fermented, Therefore, when you drink the wine, it's already there. So if you take that skin and you pour unfermented wine, it'll bust the skins. You don't pour new wine into old wineskins. But notice how he continues. The respect for the old is certainly preserved in Jesus' parable while recognizing that, God knew, uh, that God's new actions cannot be confined by the previous ways. The respect for the old is there. But God's new actions cannot be confined by the previous ways. And the Pharisees are getting disrupted in this. Jesus is moving, calling people that will follow him and advancing the kingdom. Notice this, without the help of the Pharisees. Will you be part of advancing Christ's kingdom, the new wine? Or will you stay guarding your traditions? the old wine. Will you be part of how can we reach Kingman for Christ? How can we reach Mojave County? How can we reach Peach Springs? How can we reach wherever God sends us? What are some ways? See, the method of delivering the gospel message may change. That's okay. The way people come to Christ today may not be the way that you came to Christ. They don't come by singing just as I am and walk down the sawdust aisle. In a younger generation, they're not going to walk down the aisle. But you know what? That's okay. Because they have a different processing. And the delivery method may change, right? The gospel never changes. So how do you present, pay attention now, the never-changing gospel to an ever-changing culture? Let me say that again. How do you present the never-changing gospel to an ever-changing culture? You have to think outside the box. Delivery methods may change. You and I do not have the luxury of changing the gospel message. We have the responsibility of delivering what was entrusted to us. But if our methods change... And church at times looks a little bit different. By the way, what we're doing up here would be foreign to first century Judaism anyways. So we're not the Acts church. We don't follow the Acts church pattern. But that's okay. Because we're in America, 2021. Our culture is different. But our gospel's not changing. And that's okay. We have to constantly check in with the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, am I part of the new wine? Am I, or Lord, am I, am I guarding the traditions of something that honestly are just traditions? It's not that they're unbiblical. They may not be found in the Bible. But you know what? Is this a hill that you're going to die on? We need to be advancing the kingdom. You see, when we are not careful, we can slip into some, of, some form of traditionalism that says, uh, that protects, we guard how things were, and this becomes more important than the people whom God intended to reach through that. 
In other words, paper becomes more important than people. People are not important than paper. We need to flip that. People are more important than paper. People are more important than traditionalism. People are so important that Jesus died for them. See John 3, 16. You and I have to be conscious of this because the enemy will cloud your eyes with pride and arrogance in a form of traditionalism, and you will be just like the Pharisees, questioning everything. The kingdom is advancing, and you're in the back questioning everything. I don't agree with that, don't agree with that, that, and yet people are praising God. They're being drawn to God. If the teaching is orthodox, the delivery method is different, we may be part of the old wineskin. My last point is when the kingdom of Christ advances, the concern for life becomes prominent in ministry. There's a question upon regulations of the Shabbat, the Sabbath. So what happened, they were going through the grain fields, they were picking heads of grains, probably shooking them in their hands because they're hungry. And all of a sudden, we see, lo and behold, Pharisees were saying, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? By the way, when you read the law of God in Exodus, we begin to see that there is, um, well, actually, let's just take a look here. Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or you or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. You see, the Bible remains silent as to how do you uphold the Sabbath. We know that you cannot kindle a fire on the Sabbath, and it says work, any servantile work. There's other places throughout Scripture where God says you cannot travel or there's a prohibition. In Judaism, which came to be later rabbinic Judaism, there's 39 ways to honor the Sabbath. Let me list them for you. This is what you're not supposed to do on the Sabbath, according uh, to the Mishnah. He who sows, plows, reaps, binds, sheaves, threshes, winnows, selects, fit from unfit produce or crops, grinds, sifts, kneads, bakes. He who shears wool, washes it, beats it, dyes it, spins it, weaves, makes two loops, weaves two threads, separates two threads, ties, unties, sews two stitches, tears in order to sew two stitches. He who traps a deer, slaughters it, flays it, uh, salts it, cures it, scrapes it, and cuts it up. He who writes two letters, erases two letters in order to write two letters. He who builds, tears down. He who puts out a fire, kindles a fire. He who hits with the hammer. He who transports an object from one domain to another. These are the 39 acts of labor that you shall not do on the Sabbath. So in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, they gleaned from it how to uphold the Sabbath. The Pharisees are saying what is not lawful. There is never an exclusive saying you cannot eat. So bottom line is this, and even rabbinic Judaism recognized this. If it comes to preserving a life, it is your job to violate the Sabbath to make sure people are healed and people are eating. It is your job to make sure that people are taken care of. You see, if we're not careful, we can guard our interpretation. The argument is not about honoring the Sabbath. The Pharisee says, why are they doing what is not lawful? Well, that's an interpretation on the Sabbath. And notice we can become the vanguard where our guarding of interpretations, this is how we did church, this is how we do it, becomes more important than extending compassion and preserving life. Becomes more important than taking care of <clears throat> the very people that Christ died for. Mark chapter 2 is building. He's advancing that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is always under attack. You and I will always be under attack. We will always be criticized if we're advancing the kingdom of Christ. And if we are criticized, one, that is an opportunity to reflect. So all criticism is not bad. Sometimes we go off on our tangents and somebody critiques us and we're like, well... Maybe that was a personal agenda of mine. My bad. I'm sorry. Maybe it's an opportunity for us to reflect as a church. This is a critique that's coming our way. Is there some truth to this? Let's examine it. 
Is there truth if somebody critiques me? I'm not above reproach. I don't hold the view you shall not touch the Lord's anointed. There are some pastors that will re refuse to be questioned. And I think that's arrogance. So I can be held accountable. You can be held accountable. But are we being held accountable so that we can further the kingdom of Christ? Or are you of the disposition, don't question me. I've been walking with Jesus for 30 years. Who are you? You're young enough to be my son. And we have this arrogance about us that refuses to allow truth to be spoken into our life because we think our interpretation of Scripture is vacuum sealed. Well, maybe there's an opportunity for you and I to learn from Jesus. Learn on how Jesus encounters the Pharisees. Learn how he deals with the religious people that think they have everything together. Look at how he deals with people that are irreligious, quote-unquote sinners. Look at how Jesus extends to them. Notice how he moves. Notice how he extends compassion. Notice how when he deals with the woman at the well in John, notice as you read through Scripture, notice how Jesus asks more questions than he does speak. Notice how Jesus is listening to figure out where are you at and let me build a bridge of compassion to not compromise truth. Jesus never compromises truth or doctrine. But Jesus had a way of listening to build a bridge into their life where they allowed him to speak truth. The Pharisees and the scribes refused to let Jesus build that bridge. The majority of them, we do read in the book of Acts, the church, when it begins, is dominantly Pharisees and priests before Acts 15 takes place. So we do know a big wave of them come into the Christian faith. That's after the resurrection. But do you and I move with compassion? Is your and my house, is our dwelling place, are our lives where people lived in such a way where people can encounter Jesus? People can experience forgiveness. Will we extend the call to people, say, hey, why don't you come and follow me? Hey, I would love to invite you to church. I don't, look at the way I dress. Look at the way I smell. Look at the, hey, Come on, this is a hospital, is it not? For sick people? And when that person walks through the door, looking different, gauge there's all looking different, you're like, that's not my culture. Will you still extend compassion? Or will you look at them up and down, look the other way, and refuse to engage with them? If we are not careful, when the body grows, and we advance the kingdom, Satan will use pride, arrogance, and traditional walls to prevent people from coming to the Lord. You and I need to be very conscious of our walk with Christ so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus. And even though they don't look like me, smell like me, uh, they're not part of my socioeconomic bracket, but you know what? If you're here, let me extend my reach to you. They might tell you, I'm not, I, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in your God. I don't know why I'm here. Hey, that's okay. I just want to welcome you to Kingman First. I just want to let you know my name is John. What's your name? And I hope that you come back next week. We see Jesus do this often. And Jesus, if you will, my paraphrase, took every encounter, every challenge as an opportunity to, hmm, how am I going to fit the gospel in this area? Look at the disciples a rebuttal? Hmm. Let's figure out a way to bridge the gap here and reach them with the gospel. So I have a challenge for you. As you go this week, turn your homes into places where people can, can encounter Jesus. If it's not your home, turn your life into a walking dwelling place. Wherever you go, people can encounter Jesus Listen more than speak. Ask them a question about their life. If you're a friend with them, ask them how their struggle is going. And then when they give you a moment, share with them your testimony. That's all you got to do. It's like, wow, this is how I got through the hard time or anxiety when I was hyper worried, I was anxious, etc. I just placed my faith in Christ and he's led me through my difficult times. Then close your mouth. 
If the Holy Spirit is working in that other person, there's going to be a volume of conversations going, but they're going to be curious. You might be the person that brings this spiritually paralyzed person into the presence of Jesus, and Jesus will heal them. We get the opportunity, we get the joy, we get the adventure of doing this. But will you turn your homes, will you turn your dwelling places into a place where people can encounter Jesus? Will this church continue to work through our issues and growing pains of different things? Will we continually change so that we can be a place where all people can encounter Jesus? From young to old, from all backgrounds, that we could be the hands and feet of Christ. Please bow your heads with me. Father God, as we move forward, as we just glean, Lord, just from a 30,000-foot view of Mark chapter 2, Lord, we see that you move in a way where people want to be around you. And when the apostles adopted this and they began to set aside cultural barriers, we began to see, Lord, that, man, people were drawn They were drawn to you. They were drawn to the teachings. They were drawn to the church. And the more we complicate it, the more we convolute it, the less people are drawn to you. Will you give us a spirit of humility? Lord, that may we never change the gospel message. But Lord, may we find ways to advance into the kingdom of darkness, this gospel message, and snatch people from the pits of hell so that they would come to know you. Move within us, Lord. May our homes be places of compassion, mercy, truth. May we reach out, Father. May we be part of the new wine that just is looking for ways to reach our people, our friends, our family, our colleagues. Above all, Lord, may we be your hands and your feet everywhere that we go. Lord, as we move through this week, if you need to do some cleaning in our spirits, Lord, I pray that you do within us, Lord. Please do so. We give you full access. It's in the name of Jesus we powerfully pray. It's in his name. Amen.